I feel it my assignment to be that of remembrance. Remembrance of who we are, of who our God is, and what His plan is for our lives. For we know it to be in the sixth chapter that which would be recognized as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. But in the first verse of this sixth chapter, the Bible reads, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. And if you keep it, that you may increase mightily is what verse 3 says. Talking about that land which flows with milk and honey. That is the verse preceding here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And he goes on to say, you're to teach them diligently. Everyone say diligently. Diligently unto thy children. Talk of them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Don't stop there. Bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. In verse Verse 20, for our children, for our families, and for our church family as a whole, it, it tells us, when the Son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? You, you tell your son, we were... Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. I want to preach for just a, just a little while here today on this thought, tough love, tough love. And I want to talk about these testimonies, statutes and judgments. Boy, that's, that's, that's a tough title on a Sunday morning. Testimonies, statutes, and judgments. So we'll just call it tough love. Lord, we're thankful for our time in your house. I pray you'd help me to preach with wisdom. I help, pray that you'd help me to preach with clarity. I'm asking your spirit to do what only it can do in this house today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and let everybody in the building say amen. God bless you and you may be seated. I know some really do not enjoy this, but if you feel like you're able, would you turn to someone again and would you tell them you need a little tough love? To which many of you are thinking I've already had it. No doubt you, like me, were raised in a family where you probably heard something like this said to you. I'm thankful that I was raised in a generation and in a home I wasn't thankful then, but I'm thankful now that I was raised in a home 
where kids didn't get everything they wanted. Can I get a witness in the room if you were raised where kids didn't get everything they wanted? And I'm going to tell you, even though that's counter to much of our culture today, there is this thinking that we are depriving children if we don't give them certain benefits that the world thinks is necessary. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I might. They don't need candy every time at the checkout because that's not real life. They don't need Dairy Queen every time you pass it. And that's hard for me to say. Can I tell you this? I'm not casting judgment. I'm just pastoring and maybe pestering. But not every seven-year-old, 10-year-old, or even teenager Deserves a thousand dollar phone or iPod or iPad or laptop. I didn't hear a lot of kids, but I didn't plan on it. <laughs> but what every kid deserves is for we, the body, to stay enamored by the fact that there is no one like our God. Whether we have the modern conveniences of this world or not, every kid deserves the tough love that when it's Sunday, we go to church. And when it's Wednesday, we get to Bible study. And when there's a youth event, we do everything we can to get there. We live in a world and in a culture where tough love seems to have gone by the wayside. We even see it in our parenting. Lord, help me. Because I'm going to say, and I don't want to offend, but children still need correction. Have you ever been in public and heard a child talk to a parent in a way that made you want to intervene? You know what you are? Normal. I want to give you a license. Now, I will tell you, you better need a filter before you do intervene. I had to say something. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. But what you can do is take a moment right there in that grocery store and say, Lord, I pray you'd help this sweet mama. Because our power is not an earthly power. Our power is bigger than something found in a five-step book or on a counseling desk or on that couch. Our power is a power that is housed and found in the word of God. And it is a power that we have been exposed to. It is the power of Almighty God. And so the way that we train and the way that we parent, it will be a little individual from house to house. It was that way in the 50s. It was that way in the 60s. It was that way in the 70s. It's that way all the way through the 80s, the 90s, the thousands. For those of you, it's hard to believe. For some of us, we're still trying to figure out if 2024 is a real year. But what is a non-negotiable, not depending upon generation or even century, is whether or not we raise our families to love God. For we are called to love and to serve God with all of our mind, with all of our strength, 
in an unwavering fashion. It's in Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. These judgments, these statutes, where we are given what's known as the Big Ten. Many, maybe most of you can quote them. But we are to have no gods before him. We are to have no graven images. We are not to take the name of the Lord God in vain. We still believe that you keep the Sabbath holy. Here's a big one that our entire culture needs to hear. We believe that you honor your father and your mother. We believe in that. And as long as we're going to be a Bible preaching church, we got to preach it. We believe that thou shalt not kill. That you don't commit adultery. That you don't steal. That you don't bear false witness. That you do not covet your neighbor's house. And it is this law that is to be kept in their hearts. And in the articulating of these statutes and these judgments, we receive this strong word. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And if you still to this day were a part of this culture and you would hear this language being spoken, this Hebrew being prayed, it is still culturally acceptable for this prayer to be prayed day in and day out over their family. Please play that clip. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. My 12-year-old son said, Dad, don't play the one with Adonai. Play the one with Yahweh. I said, leave me alone. I'm preaching today. <laughs> My 12-year-old son can quote that because Matthew Arrowwood is his teacher. And Matthew Arrowwood feels it very personal that every kid in that class knows, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. I need to tell you today, my 12-year-old being able to quote that in Hebrew to much of this world, if people heard them and knew he was cornbread Indiana boy, they would ask themselves, what kind of a cult is he a part of? To which I would respond, he's not a part of a cult. He's a part of the church. I'm going to preach it like I feel it. He's a part of a church that believes there's one God and he is worthy to be praised. He's worthy of us talking about him, quoting about him, memorizing scripture about him, worshiping him, exalting his name, having demonstrations of the spirit in the middle of our church. We are not apologetic that our kids can quote scripture. We are not apologetic that we run and shout and dance and praise. We are monotheistic believers. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And I take that scripture and I tell you here today, Hero Indianapolis, the Lord our God is one Lord. Hero Greenwood, the Lord our God is one Lord. Oh, I feel like preaching right now. He's not just one Lord. I know his name. His name is a name above every other name. His name is worthy to be praised. It's the only name given among men whereby we must be saved so we're not going to back down we're not going to give up we're not going to stop shouting we're not going to stop dancing we're not going to stop quoting we're not going to stop dedicating our babies I wish somebody that really believed he was worthy would give him all you've got for a minute. I wish you'd give him your voice, give him your hands, give him your wave offering. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
That's right, Brother Ewing, on this dedication day, I will not be embarrassed to be a father that dedicates my babies to the Lord. I'm not feeding my children to the lion's den. I'm not giving my children over to the to the agendas of this world. Go ahead and run a little bit, Daddy. I'm gonna take my baby to the altar and I'm gonna let my family know. I'm gonna let my church know and I'm gonna let my God know. Hero Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. Come on, we are a people that believe there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and one Father of all who is above all and through all. And the Bible says, in you all. We are one God people. We are monotheistic. Unapologetically. Here's a little tough love. You can't get everything from this world you want, but you can get everything from him you need. Come on, we've been in a finance series this month. How many know it? On Wednesday night. And I want to honor this church. You've been packing this place. If you've missed the finance series, you've missed it. God has been moving. There's been a full house on Wednesday nights. But even in the families represented here, not everybody's going to be able to give the same things. Not everybody can give golden pacifiers. Not, listen, I know what it's like to be a young parent and see somebody pushing a stroller. Our stroller did not look like their stroller. I'm going to assume you didn't get that at Walmart. That, was that not a... You might not be able to drive them around in a luxury vehicle. You might not be able to take them home to the most majestic nursery. Listen, when we, first, when we had our first baby, the baby slept. Yeah, they had a nursery. It was called the living room. But if you can't give them silver and you can't give them gold, but you can give them a love for the word of God and for the house of God and for the things of God because you teach them how to love God. I'm telling you, we look at that and we say, though you may be poor, you're rich. Though you might not have much by the world's standards, you've got a lot by heaven's standards. And any time the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord can raise up a standard on your behalf. And we teach our children to love the world. Listen, we teach our, 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 our children to love the Word of God because in the Word of God, they find promises that are associated and given to believers. It is the love of God, but with it, there, how many know there are some pretty good perks in living for God? And when we dedicate our children unto the Lord, there are some pretty good perks in that. I pray to God that these babies were dedicating. I pray that none of them have to ever feel the pangs of addiction. I pray that none of them ever have to deal with substance abuse. I pray that none of them ever have to deal with the devourer. That... Pastor, what are you talking about? This is who we are. This is what we believe. That, that the devil, like a roaring lion, everybody hear me, like a roaring lion, that when he tries to be like a roaring lion, we can say we know who the lion is, the lion of the tribe of Judah, that monotheism we believe in. It is the oneness of God, the lion of the tribe tribe of Judah stands on our behalf. I wish I could get a testimony from somebody in the room that says I can remember a time when the devil like a roaring lion was coming after me or coming after my family but here we are October of 24 and we made, we went through some stuff but we're here we've, we've made it because God keeps his promises and the Bible says let God arise and his enemies be scattered and He's kept us by his mighty hand. It's in the book. It's in the book of Matthew that I would turn your attention for Christ. 
being called out by the lawyer. What is the greatest commandment? And it is Christ who reaches Brother Watkins to the Shema. He, he reaches Deuteronomy 6 and into the fifth verse. And he states unequivocally, the greatest commandment, you've got to love God. With everything you've got, you've got to love him. Please hear me. There is no way to get out of that and be saved. You've got to love God. You've got to love him enough to let him be the God of your house. You've got to love him enough to let him be the God of your mind. You've got to love him enough to let him be the God of your heart. But what they were not prepared for Brother Roberts is for Jesus to say, but there's something that goes along with this. You've got to love your neighbor as yourself. Since you want to try to catch me up in something, I'm going to tell you what he actually did. The lawyer that wanted to catch him up, he said, I want to actually talk to you about your problem. You know law. You just don't have enough of a relationship with the God of the law to understand that you can't actually love God without loving people. I'm going to tell you right now, we are living in a society that is in love with its agendas. We're in love with political agendas. We're in love with our groups and our clubs. We're in love with our meetings and our positions. Lord, help us. We are enamored by our titles. We're enamored by our little golf clubs. We're, we're enamored by all these little, and there are subsets of society with agendas all, I mean, they range the spectrum that they are passionate about. We have enabled such a culture on our college campuses that they will march about anything. People will be shouting tomorrow about stuff you didn't even know was stuff. Walk downtown of a major city and listen to them shouting and get closer and you don't even know what they're shouting about. And I'm going to tell you, and I don't mean this condescending, but there are some that are shouting for things they don't even understand. And God forbid we ever become more intoxicated with our shout than the God of our shout. For to be a part of the body and to dedicate these babies and to be as a church that dedicates them unto the Lord, we've got to love him with everything. But then we've got to love people like ourselves. Because to really love the gospel is to know we've got to reach for everybody we can and love everyone we can one of my favorite commentaries on teaching through the text said it this way. These, these two commandments to love God and to love people. Jesus utilizes as the lens through which to see the entirety of the Torah. To really understand the law and the judgment of God. And the plan that has been put in motion. How many know there was a plan put in motion? that the Lamb of God might come for the redemption of mankind. But in order to read it appropriately and to understand this word appropriately and even to walk in this house and worship appropriately and moreover to walk back to your own homes as parents, whether new or already aged, maybe it's grandchildren or great-grandchildren at this point, but regardless of that, to walk into your not only church house, but your physical address. When you walk in, there has to be this love for God, but also this love for your neighbor that reaches and says, wait a minute, my monotheism, 
my belief in God and then my love for God lets me know that I've got to teach my children and teach my family and teach myself that we got to show love. We've got to extend love one to another. Pastor Carson, why would you preach it as tough love? Eh? To a lot of people, it's really weird how regimented you live. This whole trying to live righteous and come to church multiple times a week. You've got to make sure that you don't gauge your faithfulness on the opinion of an unbeliever. I'm going to say it again. You've got to be careful that you don't gauge the validation of your faithfulness based on the opinion of an unbeliever. If you're ever feeling a little discouraged, get a hold of one of these elders that's been through the flood and that's been through the fire that'll pull you close and say, baby, I know it's tough right now, but it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It, it will be worth it. It all. You get one of these that'll pull you close so that you don't find validation from somebody or try to get the validation in the opinion of somebody that's never even been delivered. Somebody that's never been filled with the Holy Ghost. And so it can be tough love to this world to follow after and live regimented. But I'm going to tell you, it will also cause you to become the proponent of tough love in your family. We started this service at 1130. It's 1247. One hour and 17 minutes. And some people are so done right now. Why? We live in a world that if we're not careful, we can watch three hour TV programs. Pastor, that's a little rough. It's tough love. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we want this next generation of children to know if we're going to put extra time anywhere, we're going to put it into living for God. If we're going to put extra time anywhere, we're going to put it into worshiping God. If we're going to get caught up anywhere, it's not going to be at the ballpark. It's going to be in the house. Of God. Now listen to me. I, I'm a little tough love right now, but I'm going to give a tough love in this way to tell you the devil does not get to write the script for your family and does not get to determine who your kids are going to be and what your marriage is going to look like and what your hope. In a crowd this size, we got all kinds of issues. We got problems on every scope and size. But I got good news for you. We've got a God that is able to step into every problem and take care of every situation and eradicate every single issue. He is still able. Stand with me today as I, as I close. I tell you this, we need tough love in our homes. Pastor, what do you mean by that? We need to make sure that we don't let just anything into our house, just anything into our marriage, just anything into the lives of our children. We need to make sure that when our Children, go stay the night with friends. We know what they're being exposed to. Oh, come on now. It might be okay that you let them go for a while, but you pick them up before bedtime. I don't want to embarrass my kids. Listen. Listen. Boy, I, I, this, ain't, this ain't in notes. I didn't talk about this in the first service, but I feel prompted right now. For any parent in here that's struggling, you're the parent. You have the opportunity. In fact, you have the assignment from heaven to guard what you can guard. I'm not talking about leading with fear. I'm talking about leading with wisdom. Godly wisdom. I want you to, if you will, 
Lift your hands towards heaven if you're able. I want you to pray intentional prayers right now. Starting with this first one. God, let me love you with everything I have. Would you help me, oh God, to love you with everything I have? Oh. My heart, my mind, You deserve all of my strength. Oh God, my soul is in your hands. <laughs> Hear, O <O> Israel. <laughs> the Lord our God is one. God, we want it in our heart and in our mind. These testimonies, these statutes, these judgments, oh God. When I was in Israel, I would walk through a doorway and I would see I would see these images on the frame many of you have been there these hold that little piece of paper inside of them taking the scripture so literally they gotta be on your doorpost let it be at the gates of thy house. When your family walks through the door, let it be acknowledged we know. We know that we are children of God. We need in a, we need a fresh baptism of loving God and loving people. This only happens when I'm preaching today, this tough love, it only happens if we make up our minds as families. He's gonna be the God of our home. He's gonna be the God, not just of our church, but of our home. And I know I've been preaching this lately. I can't get away from this. So if you want to you want to love God and you want to love people because you know everything hangs on these commands. I want you to lift your hands with me right now and I want you to turn this entire place into an altar for a minute before we leave this place. I thank God for the deep move of his spirit that we had earlier, but right now in this intentional moment of prayer I'm asking that you would pray application to the Word of God. Be the God of our conversations. Be the God of our marriages. Be the God of these sweet babies that we're dedicating. If you feel able, I'd like to have multiple generations represented that are able that would step out of their pew and would walk to the front of this building into what we know to be our altar area, recognizing that we remain in a fight for our homes and for our next generation to love God. And you'd walk to this altar and say, we're going to love God. And we're going to love people. We're going to love God. And we're going to love people. We come today with intentional prayer. 
Would you come? Would you call on the name of the Lord Jesus while they sing?